So as Chris mentioned, uh, I'm an application engineer out of the Oregon office, and I've put together this tips and tricks presentation, which is basically going to be 30 tips and tricks, and it's going to be pretty rapid fire. So I'm thinking one to two minutes per tip or trick. So basically what I've done is I've put these together, compiled a list uh, through, you know, just doing tech support or day-to-day, -day, just working with customers. And every time I let them know about something, they're like, hey, I didn't know about that. I wish I knew about that sooner. So over the years, I've gotten a list going. So I've compiled my, my top 30 here for tips and tricks. Um, I've updated it year over year. So um, with that, I'd like to get started, and we can start off with tip number one. So just kind of starting out, tip number one, rebuild your model. So we're going to start out pretty simple. Um, there's a hotkey for your rebuild in SOLIDWORKS, and that is Control-B. So if you hit Control-B, it's going to be a standard rebuild. This is the same thing as hitting that stoplight icon in the top of your um, SOLIDWORKS menu. So the difference between a standard rebuild or the, the, the definition of a standard rebuild is it only rebuilds changed features. So you'll see a little stoplight next to your features. However, there is another rebuild that I recommend using, Control-Q. This is what's called a force rebuild. This will rebuild your entire feature tree regardless of changes. So the other one only rebuilds change features. This one rebuilds everything. So it may take longer depending on if you have a really complex model. Uh, but I use this one whenever I open up any customer model or even my own model, I rebuild the whole thing first because that will show me if there's any errors throughout the tree right away that I can address before finding out later on that, hey, there might be an error in my tree. So one thing to note, this cannot be found in any toolbars or menus, but it does have an icon in SOLIDWORKS. So you can add that icon to your toolbars if you want to. Uh, and with that being said, there's two more I'd like to mention. Control-Shift-B is a standard rebuild for all configurations, and Control-Shift-Q is a forced rebuild for all configurations. So if you deal with configurations, you can use either Control-Shift-B or Control-Shift-Q. If you deal with a lot of configurations, just hit a Control-Shift-Q. It may take a while to rebuild, but before you save or when you save. So just a, a quick uh, shortcut for getting those rebuild icons. Now, right away, I have a tip one and a half, uh, something called verification on rebuild. So not a lot of people know this is here, but your standard rebuild in SOLIDWORKS only checks against adjacent features and edges. So it's faster in that sense because it's not checking everything, but it may actually miss some things. And I actually have an example I can show in SOLIDWORKS of where this may come in handy. So I'm going to open up a model in SOLIDWORKS. This is basically a sheet metal bend. And let's say I go ahead and add a bend to it to where there's interference. Now, if I try to rebuild, I'll hit a Control-Q, I'm not getting any errors in SOLIDWORKS. And that's because I'm only using a standard rebuild or non-verification on rebuild. Inside your options under performance, there is a checkbox for verification on rebuild. This is advanced error checking. So notice when I turn that on and I do another rebuild, well, now SOLIDWORKS is telling me there's an error. The part intersects itself at the bend operation. So the reason it's not catching the error is because my standard check is only checking against adjacent bends, where that bend is fine, and it's saying this bend is fine, and it's saying the bend on top is fine, but it's not checking anything outside of the adjacent faces or edges. So with the advanced error checking on, it will catch any errors in your model. Now, on the flip side of that, that doesn't mean you can't just go into your performance, turn off verification and rebuild, and say, oh, my SOLIDWORKS model works, this is it, save it, close, and I'm done. It doesn't quite work that way. You can't just turn that off and say there's no errors. Uh, but what I do recommend doing is when you're running models on complex models or surfaces, it's a good idea to just turn this on every once in a while to do a thorough error check, error check and then turn it back off because it's going to save you on performance. So just letting you know that this option is there. If you work on anything complex, turn it on every once in a while. Um, or even models that are really old in previous versions that you're importing, turn that on, just see if there's any errors, and then you can turn it back off and, and go about your normal SOLIDWORKS day. So tip number two, dismiss messages. Now, I'm sure we've all seen dismiss messages before, or in this case, a message that prompts you in SOLIDWORKS. So in this case, I'm going to open up an assembly, and it can't find a file. So in this case, I have three options. I can either browse for it, suppress it, or suppress all. So I'm going to suppress this one component, and it's going to open up my assembly with my component suppressed. But let's go ahead and do that again, because there's something else inside that message box that I kind of skipped over. So I'm going to open up that file, and then we see a little checkbox at the bottom called Don't Show Again. So I'm sure we've all seen that. We're 
tired of seeing this message, we hit don't show again. But the important thing to note is when you hit don't show again, whatever option you choose is going to be the default answer for every time that message pops up. So if I hit don't show again and I say suppress this component, every single time I'm going to be prompted with that message, it's going to automatically suppress it. So no, I'm going to go back, open my model, it's not even going to prompt this time, it's just going to automatically suppress because I hit don't show again. So this is a very common question we get, well how do I bring that message back? So if you want to bring back any dismiss message, what you're going to do is go up to your options icon, you can get there through tools options as well, and down here in messages, errors, and warnings, any dismiss message that you have, so in this case unable to locate external file, or unable to locate the file, would you like to find it yourself? That was dismissed. So if I want to bring it back, I'm going to put a checkbox next to it, or a check mark next to it, hit OK, and then the next time I go to open up that assembly, I'm prompted again. So I can hit suppress component, and it's going to prompt me again until I hit don't show again. So one important thing to note, if you hit don't show again, whichever option you choose, it will default to that option every time you open it. And if you want to be reprompted with that message, you can turn it back on again in your options under messages, errors, and warnings. So tip number three, use mouse gestures. So this is one of the new, uh, I guess, command options that SOLIDWORKS has added to make things a little bit easier when trying to choose different commands in SOLIDWORKS. So I'm sure you may have launched this one on accident at one point and you weren't quite sure what it was. But to launch the mouse wheel, what you do is you hold down your right mouse button and move your mouse a little bit. So this is what's called the mouse gesture wheel. So again, hold down your right mouse button, move your mouse a little bit, and you're presented with a wheel with certain commands. Now I'm just kind of moving my mouse around to actually launch the command, move your mouse over it, and then it's going to access that command. So in this case, I have a front view. Now those mouse gestures change depending on which environment you're in. So I was in the assembly environment, and now if I'm in the part environment, I can launch my fillet tool very quickly. So using mouse gestures is really useful, and if you've launched it on accident, you hold down the right mouse button, and you can choose your commands. Now these wheels are also completely customizable. So if you'd like to customize them, right click on your command manager and go to customize, and you'll have a few tabs. One of them is mouse gestures. So SOLIDWORKS has enhanced the mouse gestures year over year. Uh, so depending on which version you have, you'll have a, your option of different choices. So you can go down to two gestures if you want, where it's just a top or bottom. You can go to three, eight, or even 12 gestures if you want. But you have to be really precise with your commands at that point. But as you get more used to it, those gestures are right there at your mouse. So you don't have to move your mouse all the way up to the command manager every time to launch your commands. And what's really nice, too, is just so you can remember where all of these are, there is an option to print these gestures out so you can put it as a PDF next to your cubicle or wherever you're working. That way you can tell where your commands are until you get uh, more used to it as you get started using those. And I guess the last note I'll say, if you want to add any commands, all of the commands here are listed in the customize menu. So let's say I wanted to close my drawing. I can add this command just by dragging and dropping it, and now that's going to be on my mouse wheel in the part environment. So definitely use mouse gestures. It's going to save you a lot of time as you go through these. So I'll just go ahead and close this part, and we can move on to tip number four. Use the S key. So this is another one of those shortcut menus that you can use, and again, you're going to find it in your customize menu. But instead of using the mouse gesture, if you hit the S key, it's going to bring up a shortcut menu with common commands you use in that context. So in this case, this is my assembly level commands. If I open up my part and I hit the S key, here are some common part level commands I can use. So again, there's my fillet. So if I want to customize the S key, let's say you'd like to use the S key over your mouse gestures, Go to your shortcut bars, and this is immediate as you change it. So let's go ahead and add, in this case, uh, we'll add, we already have fill it, maybe convert entities over here. So as soon as I add it and hit OK, it's now on my shortcut menu that I can get to it very quickly. So a combination of mouse gestures or a combination of your S key, notice I can get to my options very quickly without having to move my mouse around a ton. So definitely use those. Definitely use those shortcuts contained in SOLIDWORKS to help make your life easier. 
Now one thing is, down here I have a bullet, it also launches the search command. So that's my next tip, use command search. So I'm going to open up another part here, and I'm going to hit the S key like I did before, but where I want to point your eyes to is the top right of my screen. So I'm going to start typing, and I'm just going to start typing dynamic reference. And if we go up to the top of the screen now, notice it's actually typing inside my command search. So if you have not used the command search before, it's very useful for finding any command in SOLIDWORKS. So in this case, if you don't know where a command is, but you know what it's called, you can do a command search. Now for the command search to work, you'll have to hit this little drop down in the top and make sure you're searching commands uh, because there is an option to search help or models or files. So make sure you're searching commands and then say you're searching for a command dynamic reference visualization and you don't remember where it is, you can hit this little eyeball, locate, or eyeball icon and I'm going to take my hand off the mouse SOLIDWORKS is going to take over, go through the menus, and tell me exactly where that command is located. So something else you can do uh, with this command is I'm going to drag this off because I want to add another one. If I'm in any kind of um, command that I want to run and I want to search for a command called dynamic mirror, you can also launch that command from here or even just drag it directly onto your command manager. So that command search serves many purposes. And again, you can launch it two different ways. You can click up here or you can just hit the S key and it's going to start typing up there for you. So definitely use the command search. I don't expect anybody to remember where every command is in SOLIDWORKS. There's way too many of them. So use the command search, hit the S key, go up there, search your commands. It'll make your life a whole lot easier. Tip number six, manage the command manager. How many times has this ever happened to you? where your command manager is no longer docked and you're wondering how you got there or even worse yet, how you fix it. So if this ever happened to you, I'll show you how it happens. If you try to undock your command manager, if you just click on your command manager and drag, it's going to tell you the command manager, you have to drag it by the tabs to undock it. So what that means is any of these tabs down here, if you were to click and drag these tabs, that's what undocks your command manager. Now if you want to redock your command manager, click up here on the bar where you can grab your command manager and it'll give you those four arrows. You can dock your command manager to the left of your screen. And if I want to undock it again, drag it by the tabs, I can dock it to the right hand side of my screen. And again, if I want to undock it, I can do that. Or traditionally to the top of your screen. So I'm just dragging it onto those docking icons and it will dock the command manager for me. Now a little tip also, if you ever undock it and you just want to redock it quickly, it was an accident, just double click your command manager on the top there and it will redock it back to where it was. So just double click on it if it was an accident and you want to redock it really quick, just double click. Now if you don't like that functionality at all, you can turn that off. If you right click the command manager and hit customize, you can lock your command manager and toolbars. So this will lock it in place. If I hit OK and I try to drag it now, nothing's going to happen. So if you don't want your command manager to ever move, just go into your options. You can turn that off and you can lock the command manager and toolbars. That way it doesn't happen to you again. But if it does, quick tip, you can double click on it and it will redock it. Tip number seven, dimension to min and max of arcs. So I've got a sketch here and it's just got two sketch circles. Now if I were to take a dimension between we'll say the left hand circle and the right hand circle, notice what dimension it gives me. It will always give me center point to center point. But I don't have to accept that center point to center point. Let's say I want a dimension to the minimum radius of an arc or a maximum radius. If I select really carefully on the outside here and I select really carefully on the other side, notice it still gives me center to center. So if you ever want to dimension to a min or max point of an arc or circle, hold down the shift key. If you hold down the shift key while dimensioning, it will allow you to pick the maximum conditions of your arc. So holding down the shift key while in smart dimension will allow you to choose minimum and maximum conditions. But let's say you've already added your dimension. You're never locked in. You can always change that. If you were to just select your dimension and go over here to your leaders tab, you can actually change your arc condition from center, min, and max of the first circle to center, min, or max of the second. So 
in this case, I can go from a max condition on the first circle to a min condition on the second. So you can always go back in and change that, and that's true of any dimension that you add while you're adding it, either in smart dimension, I can hold down the shift key and go from min to min. So a little tip there when dimensioning from circles, hold down the shift key, or if you've already added the dimension, just go into the leaders tab and you can change your arc conditions. Tip number eight, A key toggles line to arc. So in this case, what I'm going to do is create a brand new sketch, and I'm just going to start with my line command. Now, I'm going to draw a line straight up, and the next thing I'm going to do is if I click again, it's going to add another straight line. However, if I hit the A key, and I just want to press it once, so a note I want to tell you guys, just press it once. If you hold down the A key, it's going to continually toggle back and forth until it kicks you out of the command. So just press it once. So if I press the A key once, it's going to toggle to a tangent arc. And if I hit the A key, it's going to toggle back to a line. Now, also pay attention to where your cursor is. So notice I'm going to put my cursor just to the left of this inference line and hit the A key again. It's going to go tangent in the other direction. So I'll hit A to go back to line and then change my tangency, which quadrant I'm in, hit the A key again, and notice it's changing the tangency. So depending on the quadrant that your cursor is in when you hit the A key, you can actually actually capture whatever tangency location that you want by hitting the A key. So I can go around and draw an arc, and then it'll kick me back into line. So for users of SOLIDWORKS, uh, for older versions of SOLIDWORKS, there was a way to do this before the A key. And the way to do that before the A key was if you were going to draw your second line and you moved your cursor back over the endpoint and came back out, that was another way of going from line to arc within the line command. So two ways to go from line to arc. You can either hit the A key or move your cursor back over the endpoint of the line, and that will transition you from the line command into the arc. And then once you've drawn that arc, it will take you back into the line command. So tip number nine, use dynamic mirror. So I already mentioned dynamic mirror because this is one of my favorite commands in SOLIDWORKS, but I'll go ahead and give you a little example of how you can use it. So the way dynamic mirror works is it does require a mirror line first. So I'm going to draw a mirror line, and this is going to be my mirror entity. Now, I'm going to search for dynamic mirror because I never know where it's located, and I'm going to hit search. And it is located in tools, sketch tools, dynamic mirror. But I use it so often, I'm just going to add it to my toolbar. So I'm going to research, add this to my sketch toolbar, and I'm going to activate dynamic mirror. So it's going to ask for a sketch line to mirror about, and dynamic mirror is a, one of the commands in SOLIDWORKS called a persistent command. So notice it's dark gray. It's going to be on constantly. So dynamic mirror is currently activated. I can see two hash marks on this line indicating that it is my mirror line. And what dynamic mirror is going to do is, regardless of whatever I draw on the left hand or right hand side, it is going to mirror it to the other side. And what's really nice about dynamic mirror is if I change things, it will change on both sides at once, whether it be the size or location. So one thing to note about dynamic mirror, just try not to cross the mirror line, because if you cross the mirror line, and I'll show an example here, that's how you get overlapping entities. So just while in dynamic mirror, and this is true for all mirror techniques, try not to cross the mirror line, because then it makes things a little more complex. But while dynamic mirror is active, whatever you sketch on the left-hand side will go to the right-hand side as well, and vice versa. So the way this is possible is what it's doing is it's adding symmetric relations for you. So it's a quick way of adding symmetric relations. And again, it's on until you turn it off. So once you turn off dynamic mirror, it will no longer perform that automatic symmetric relation function. But definitely use dynamic mirror. It's really easy to um, create mirrored sketches that way. Just set your mirror line first, and then no matter what you sketch, it's going to get mirrored to the other side with a symmetric relation for you. Now, a little added value on tip nine. Uh, one thing to note is you can also use a plane to mirror about in a 2D sketch. So in this case, what I'm going to do is take a perpendicular sketch, and then for my dynamic mirror, I'm going to use the plane as my dynamic mirror. So I'm using a plane now in a 2D sketch so that as I sketch on one hand or one side, it's still mirroring to the other. So you don't have to do a line. You can also use a plane as a way to mirror these. Uh, completely works the exact same way. And if you want to delete those, you can. 
So dynamic mirror, you can use a plane as well. And then one more tip, in 2018 and newer, you can also mirror about a plane while in a 3D sketch. So this is new in 18, I love this capability. If you have a 3D sketch, you can now mirror 3D sketches. So in this case, I have a complex spline. So if I want to mirror these entities, I can just select this and we'll take the mirror plane. In this case, I believe it is the front plane. So you can mirror 3D sketches. That way, if you go back and you just want to do one big sweep, change this to one millimeter, you can now mirror 3D sketches and it's going to recognize that all as one 3D sketch. So the ability to mirror about planes as well, mirror your 2D sketches, and now you can mirror 3D sketches as well. So tip number 10, use power trim. Now this is a really cool command, power trim in SolidWorks. This is the only trim tool you're going to need. Uh, you're going to find it is, it is a sketch tool under trim entities. You have a few different trim tools, but power trim is the only one you're going to need. So the way you use power trim is if you click and hold down your mouse button, it's going to track your movements. So in this case, it's tracking my mouse movements until I let go of the mouse. Now, where that's nice in the trim tool is if I click and drag over these entities, it is going to trim to closest for me. Now, two things are happening. It's tracking my mouse movements, and I haven't let go of my mouse button yet, but there is also a little red box. If I were to back up without letting go of my mouse over those red boxes, Power Trim actually remembers what entities that it trimmed and it will undo the trim. That way if you were going down and you go right and you meant to go left, instead of exiting your trim tool, undoing it and going back, you can just go back over that one and then trim the one you want it to. So it's really nice about trim. You can control Z and undo that. Um, if I go back into, so you can undo your trim command, which is really, really useful. Uh, some other things you can do in trim entities, or one of the nice things that it's doing, is it's actually adding relations. Notice those relations that I added as you trim. So what the trim tool is doing, or what Power Trim is doing, is it's maintaining design intent. It knew this was a continuous line, and it assumes that you wanted that line to stay continuous, so it added a collinear relationship. So it will smartly trim, it will untrim, it is undoable, and it will add relations for you. Now there's also one more function of the trim tool that not a lot of people know about. So we know we can trim, but the trim tool in Power Trim can also extend. So in this case, if you have a line that is too short and you want to extend it, you can just click and drag it, and it will also extend your line. So I can extend this line down here, I can extend this one over here, and then using the same power trim, I can just extend off the ends, or trim off the ends. So the power trim is the only trim tool you're gonna need. It, there's really a ton of functions built into the power trim, so definitely use the power trim, get used to using it. I call it the Swiss Army knife of trim tools. You can really do pretty much anything with it. So use power trim. Tip 11, moving under defined sketches. So how many times has this happened to you? You've had, you have a sketch, it's underdefined, and my origin is over here, so I want to move the whole thing. So you highlight the whole sketch, and then you go to drag and move it, and it just blows up on you. Well, here's a tip. I'm going to undo that. If you select everything in an underdefined sketch and you want to move it all as one block, hold down the Shift key. If you hold down the Shift key, you can move the whole block, and it's not going to blow up on you. So highlight the whole thing hit shift, and then you can move it and move it closer to your origin and add your relations and dimensions as you need to, to lock it in. Now there is another way to do this. You can also do this using a new function in SolidWorks called shaded sketch contours. So this is a sketch command, and if you activate shaded sketch contours, it is a persistent command, it will allow you to select the shaded area all as one selection and move your sketch, even if it's underdefined as well. So use shaded sketch contours, or if you're just trying to do something quick and it's underdefined, highlight it all and hold down the shift key. You can move it all together. So tip 11.5, the contour select tool. So inside a sketch, the contour select tool has always been there. If you right click, you can choose contour select tool, which allows you to choose different areas to extrude. So say I could pick this area, go straight to my extrusion, and that's all I take. However, a quick way to get to that tool, and you don't need shaded sketch contours on for this, if you hold down the Alt key, you can go straight into your contour select tool. 
So I can pick out any contour from here and go straight to extrude. Now something else as well, if you hold down Control and Alt, you can select multiple contour areas and extrude them all at once. So combination of the Control and Alt key, the Alt key is a quick way of selecting different contours, jumps you directly into the Contour Select tool. Tip number 12, Feature Tree Navigation. So this is an option, this has been there forever in SolidWorks, but in your options under Feature Manager, you have the ability to turn on what's called arrow key navigation. Now, pretty simple, what it sounds like is if you're in your tree and you hit the down arrow, it will move up and down your tree, so that's pretty simple, but there are some other functions for it. Some other functions include, if you're using the up and down arrow while in your tree, is let's say you want to expand a folder. If you hit the right arrow, it will expand the folder, and if you hit the left arrow, it will collapse it. Now that also works at the top of the tree. If you're at the top of the tree, you can hit the left arrow to collapse the whole tree and right arrow to expand the whole tree. Now what's even better about that is if you select the rollback bar down here while the arrow key navigation is on and you just select the rollback bar once, you can then use the arrow keys to move your rollback bar up and down so you can suppress and unsuppress features. That way you're not having to guess where that rollback bar is, grab it just exactly and move it up and down in your tree. So I've written them out, uh, just kind of some actions that you can do. The up, care, up arrow, down arrow moves, left and right will expand, collapse, and then if you select the rollback bar, you can move the rollback bar with the arrow keys. Now kind of a little extra tip, um, there are some hotkeys to expand your entire tree and collapse your entire tree. So if you want to expand everything, select the top of your tree and hit the asterisk key. It's going to expand everything, including folders and features. And if you want to collapse everything, hit Shift-C, and that will collapse everything in your tree. So a couple, couple hotkeys you can use to expand your tree uh, using the asterisk key, and then Shift-C to collapse everything. So tip 13, filters. Now I'm sure we've all seen this at least some point in using SOLIDWORKS, either accidentally or on purpose, but if you were to accidentally hit a key and all of a sudden there is this pink filter next to your icon or next to your mouse, that means there's a filter on in SOLIDWORKS. Now if I try to go and select an edge at this point, I can't, and it's going to make your life really difficult. So there's two hot keys I want you to remember whenever you see this pink filter. The F5 key and the F6 key. So I hit the F5 key, and what that does is it brings up my filters toolbar. Now the other hotkey I mentioned, F6, will toggle them off. So F6 toggles filters on and off, where the F5 key toggles the toolbar on and off. So the biggest reason filters usually get accidentally pressed is because the hotkey for filter vertices is V, the filter edges hotkey is E, and the filter faces hotkey is X. So those are the most common ones that get hit accidentally. When you hit those hotkeys, it turns on the filters. So if it ever happens to you, again, F6 will turn them off, or F5 will turn on the toolbar so you can actually see what those filters are. So anytime that's happened, again, those are SOLIDWORKS filters. Tip 14, delete and patch. So this is great for imported geometry, and what I mean by that is this is an imported solid, so this is just a dumb solid, where let's say I actually wanted to remove these holes. Now if this was a SOLIDWORKS feature, I could just select the feature and hit the delete key, but it's not. I can't find a hole feature inside this, so how do I get rid of this hole? Well in cases for imported geometry, this is really useful. You can actually, in your right click menu, there is a face command called delete face. So if you don't see delete face, you may have to hit these two arrows down here, and then all face commands will come up. Uh, and then if you want delete face to show up every time, go to the bottom and hit this customize menu. And then next to delete face, you can put a checkbox. So next time you right click, delete face will show up right away. So I'm going to delete this face, and I'm going to use a very specific option called delete and patch. What this is going to do is delete the face, but patch and extend the around surrounding faces until they're solid. So I'm going to delete and patch. I'm going to delete this face and patch the adjacent faces to heal it up as if the hole wasn't even there. So I'm going to do the same thing down here. I'm going to delete the face, delete and patch. It's going to extend the adjacent faces as if the hole wasn't there. Now you can select multiple faces as well. So I'm going to use a selection technique called select tangency. It's going to grab all four of these faces 
and I'm going to select delete face on all four, and I'm going to delete and patch with those as well. Now what's even better is delete and patch works on fillet edges as well, because it's going to see the adjacent faces on the top and the side, and it is going to extend those faces until they meet. And I can do it for the other side as well. And again, this was an imported solid, no SolidWorks features. I'm just deleting and patching those faces. And then I can go through and add my SolidWorks features if I wanted to afterwards. So if I wanted to add a chamfer in this case, I could then just add a chamfer on the other side. It's a little bit large, so I'll make it smaller. And I've gone ahead and changed the entire design intent of this part using what we call direct edit, direct model editing using delete face. So delete face is awesome. You find it in your right mouse button. And again, if you don't see it, go to the bottom of your menu and you can add it. So this is kind of an intermission because I know I've covered a lot of tips already. Tip number 15 is ask me for a PDF of this presentation. So I know I'm going through a lot of information. I know it's pretty rapid fire. But there's my email. You can take a screenshot of this if you want. I will have my email up again at the end of this. But if you want a PDF presentation of this, it's basically the slides that I have here. I try to put as much information as possible on them. That way you can just have a quick reference for all of these tips through the presentation. And like I said, I've, I've, I'll put this up again at the end. Um, and also if you've got a tip or trick you'd like to see, if you know a way to use SolidWorks that you think everyone else should know also, let me know. If you want credit, I'll give you credit in the presentation. If you don't, that's okay. Um, we'll put the presentation together, and if it's a good tip, it may make it in here. So let me know. If you have a good one, uh, send me an email. So tip number 16, there's another face command we can use called move face. So we saw delete face, but again, for move face, we have a bunch of imported geometry. This is great for editing geometry that's already there. So you'll find it in your right mouse button. You can move a face. And what's nice with move face is if I just move it, it's going to extend that face out. Now, I can also use end conditions such as up to body. So I can move that face up to another body, and it's as if I had made that to begin with. Now, you can also find move face uh, by searching it. So in this case, if I go to the my move face command, I can move multiple faces at once. So in this case, if I want to select all of these faces, I can select them all at once and extend each face out individually. Now, if I have a plane out here that I want to extend up to with my end conditions, I can say up to surface, and in this case I can choose my surface, it's hidden in my tree, but if I choose a surface at an offset angle, it's going to move all of those faces up to that surface. And what's even better is if I go back to move face, it will even take more complex geometry such as all of the end faces, and I can just extend this entire part out all with one move face command. So again, for direct model editing for imported geometries, move face is a great tool. And again, that's found in your right mouse button. If you don't see it, you may have to go and add it just like we did delete face. So tip 17, use select other. So in this case, I've got a model, and I want to extrude this sketch down to the bottom face of this ratchet head. Now, what I'd have to do if I wanted to go down to the bottom face, let's say I want to go offset from the bottom surface, I need to select that bottom surface. But if I hover over these faces, I can't select the bottom surface through here. So instead of rotating my model, I could rotate my model and I could grab it just as easily. But if you don't want to rotate your model, what you can do is if you right click, there is a selection tool called Select Other. Now, while you're in the Select Other command, there's two options. If I right click, I will hide a face. And if I left click, I will select a face. So in this case, what you can do is if you hover over a face and I right click, it will hide that face so that I can select a face that's underneath it. So as soon as you left click, it's going to select the face and kick you out of the command. But let's go back into select other to see what else you can do with it with select other. Let's say you hide a face, but now you want to bring it back. If you hold down the shift and right click, it will unhide those faces. So if you hit a face that you really didn't need to, shift right click will unhide it. And then right click, you can hide another face. But as soon as you left click, it's going to kick you out of the select other command with the selected face that you have. So then you can do an offset face without moving your model at all. So definitely use select other. Tip number 18. Control drag is a quick way to create a reference plane. 
So in this case, I've got another model, and I want to create an offset plane from the front plane. Now, the way I traditionally do it is go to reference plane, create my plane command, select my plane, then define the offset, which is a lot of clicks. Now, if you just hold down the control key and drag your front plane, it's going to automatically kick you into that offset plane command. So control drag on a plane that's already existing kicks you directly into the offset plane. Now, in this case, if I wanted one more definition, I can just right click and select the midpoint of this. And I've now got a midplane being driven by the midpoint geometry of my weld knit, which is now perfect to use as a mirror plane. So control drag on a reference plane will create a copy. Tip number 19, I really like this one, tab to hide. And this works on both multi-bodied parts and assemblies. So the way tab to hide works is if you hover over, and this is a multi-bodied part, if you hover over a body or a part in assembly and you hit the tab key, it will hide that part for you. So let me do it a couple more times. As long as your mouse key or mouse icon is over a part, you can hit the tab key and it will hide that part. Now to unhide, if you hover your mouse over where that part was located and you hit shift tab, it will unhide that part. So with that being said, there's a couple other ways we can use it. If you hold down the tab key and then move your mouse around, it's like you're kind of painting things hidden. And you can do the same thing with shift tab. If you hold down shift tab, it will unhide as long as you paint over it. But a big problem you have with that is, okay, I've hidden a few things. Now how can I tell what's hidden? So to build off that, there's a couple ways to tell what's hidden. The easiest is probably if you right click, there is an option to show hidden bodies. So right click, show hidden bodies, and then it's kind of going to give you an inverse of what's hidden and what's not. So whatever's hidden will show up in this show hidden. As you select them, it will unhide them so that as you go back, once you exit your show hidden, you'll have all of your parts shown here. Another quick way to tell if your hide show is using the display pane. Inside, if you have your bodies listed, the display pane has a column directly for hide show, so you can actually just toggle that through a click. So a couple ways you can do it. But the big tip I want to show you that not a lot of people know about is we know that tab hides. We know holding it down hides a bunch. We know shift tab unhides. But this works in assemblies and parts. If you hold down control shift tab, it will give you a highlight of all of the currently hidden bodies. And then as you select them, while I'm holding down control shift tab, you can then select those bodies and they will unhide. So control shift tab will give you a preview of any hidden parts or bodies. And then as you select them, it will unhide those parts for you. So use tab to hide. I use this one a ton. It makes working with multi-bodied parts and even assemblies a whole lot easier. So tab key to hide. Tip number 20, use move copy body. So sometimes it's easier than patterning. So in this case, I'm going to take my weldment body and I've got a skid down here, and I want to move this skid up to the top. Now, I could use a linear pattern for bodies, but I would have to define first what bodies I want to pattern, and then the direction, and then make sure I have the right offset, and then make sure if I want to tie any intelligence into it, I have to make sure the linear pattern's intelligent, and you know, that's a lot of work. So if I just want to move this skid up to the top, there is another command I can use called move copy bodies. So with move copy bodies, I can actually take that bottom skid body, and in this case, I'm going to choose to copy it. And instead of doing a delta translation, I'm going to do it by entities. And I'm going to say I want the point of this skid to be at the top of my weldment. So as soon as I hit OK, I've now copied my skid to the top. And what's really nice is because it's being driven by geometry is if my skid layout ever changes, my move copy body moves with it. So sometimes it's easier than using linear pattern, especially useful in weldments because weldments are multi-bodied parts. So definitely use move copy bodies. Tip number 21, lock your rotation axis. So this is something else that not a lot of people know are there, and sometimes it's actually a headache because you didn't even know you activated it. So the way you activate or lock your axis rotation is whenever you rotate, kind of rotate your part around the center of the screen, which is fine. That's what we want. However, you can lock your axis of rotation if you hover over an entity and you hit your mouse button, the middle mouse button, so the scroll wheel. If you press it once, it will highlight that face 
and lock the rotation axis around that face. So it works on cylindrical faces. It works on circular edges as well. So in this case, if I wanted to take this cylindrical face, I can lock my rotation axis around that circular face. So if you've ever on accident seen that purple highlight and your part didn't quite rotate how you wanted, it's because you were locking the axis rotation. So it also works on chamfered edges. It will go around the center axis and even planar faces. So you can even choose planar faces and it will rotate around those planar faces. So middle mouse button will lock that rotation axis for you. And then as you hold down the middle mouse button to rotate, it will move around that axis. Now another little tip, little extra tip, is if you're ever zooming in and out and you choose to lose your part, well, we always say zoom to fit to bring it back. If you didn't know this, if you just double click your middle mouse button, that's also the shortcut for zoom to fit. So if you're ever rotating around using that middle mouse button, a lot of functions that you may not have known were there. If you hover over an entity and hit your middle mouse button once, it will lock the axis of rotation. And if you double click your middle mouse button, it will zoom to fit as well. So this works on planar, cylindrical, conical, circular and linear edges, and even axes and points. So you can lock your rotation around a point if you want. So tip number 22, hide faces when mating. So this is in, I believe they added this in 2018. Um, so the newer versions of SolidWorks now allow you to hide faces while mating. And what that means is while you're in the mate command, so I'm just going to go ahead and go to the mate command, and I want to mate the top of this face to the bottom of my bracket, but I can't see that bottom face. So very similar to select other, instead of going into select other, what I'm going to do while I'm in the make command is just hit the alt key and it's going to hide that face so that I can select the face under it without having to rotate my model. So I'll go ahead and finish this up with a cylindrical mate and there's my rotation. So I'm going to do that one more time with a more complex mate and in this case, I want to match up these cylindrical faces, but then I want to center this block inside my yoke. So in this case, what I'm going to do is use an advanced mate called width mate. This is one of my favorite mates, but it has you rotating your model around a lot to select all your faces. So using the alt key to hide makes it a whole lot easier. I need to uh, select the two sides of my, my cube here. So I'm going to select my first face, hit the alt key to hide, select the other face, and then do the same thing with this one where I can hit the Alt key, choose my other face, and now I've selected my faces through other faces using the Alt key to hide. So this works in the Mate command. Just hit the Alt key while you're hovering over it. Shift Alt will also unhide the face, very similar to Select Other. So as long as your mouse is over the faces you want to hide or unhide, hitting the Alt key or Shift Alt will hide or unhide those faces. Tip number 23, use smart mates. So these are some icons of some smart mates that are pretty common to SolidWorks. So you can smart mate to edges, to faces, to points, to cylindrical edges. And then we have some special ones called peg and hole that actually add three mates all at the same time. And I'll show you how to use that. So in this case, I've got another assembly. And notice there's no mates. There are no mates in my mate folder. And using smart mates, I'm going to add three mates at the same time. So to launch smart mates, what I'm going to do is hold down the Alt key, and then I'm going to click an edge and drag it. Now notice I'm going to select the circular edge and click and hold. There is now a paper clip next to my icon. That's telling me I've activated smart mates. So by holding down the Alt key and dragging an edge, activate smart mates. And what I'm going to do is select or hover over an edge that I want to mate it to, and it's going to give me that special peg and hole. Um, icon for smart mates, and as soon as I let go of the mouse button, it's added three mates for me. So just by dragging that edge, I was able to add a concentric between the two outer faces, a concentric between the pattern, because they had matching patterns, and a coincident for the two faces. So by using alt drag to launch smart mates, it allows you to add those mates a whole lot easier. Now you don't have to add multiple mates at the same time either. This works for simple geometries as well, such as cylindrical faces. So if I hold down the Alt key and I drag this cylindrical face, notice there's my paper clip. I just have to hover over another cylindrical face and it's going to give me the concentric icon. So there's my concentric mate. Now I'm going to undo that because it's 
it's not looking for exactly the right hole sizes either. It's basically just looking for geometry. So any cylindrical face that I hover over, it's going to try to add that cylindrical mate, regardless of orientation. So in this case, it's just looking for circular features. Now, let's say this is the mate I want to add, but it's in the wrong orientation. If you let go of the Alt key, you can then hit the Tab key, and that is going to flip your orientation. Now, I know there's a lot of um, keys in here. It's all, about the, it's all about the order you press them. This may take some practice. Just note that as soon as you let go of your mouse button, it will add the mate. So make sure the mouse button is the last thing you release. So if you release the Alt key after you've um, joined your faces, the Tab key will then switch your alignment. And then once you're happy with your alignment, let go of the mouse key, and we've now added a concentric mate. Now that also works for planar faces, so if I hold down the Alt key and drag one planar face to another, let go of the mouse, I've now added a planar mate. So it's a whole lot easier now to add these mates without having to go through the mate command. So I'll do this one more time. You can do it with edges as well. If I hold down the Alt key, I can go edge to edge. There is my edge smart mate where it's now got some hinge action. And then I can, with one more smart mate, go edge to edge again. And now this is fully mated in place. So another little half tip also, say you're moving apart and you need to reorient this part to mate it a little easier. If you have a part that's free to float in space, you can hold down the right mouse button and you can actually rotate that part in space on its own. That way you can orient it a little bit better, make sure you can see your edges, and then when you let go of the right mouse button, you can then mate it to your part. So I'm going to use another smart mate. Again, Alt key to drag cylindrical face to, or cylindrical edge to cylindrical edge. Let go of the Alt key, I can hit tab to switch. And then let go of the mouse button will add all of my mates. So definitely use smart mates. Again, it's launched with the Alt drag as you're using them. You can do edges, points, faces, cylindrical faces, even coordinate systems. It works for that as well. So tip number 24, you can copy components by dragging. So let's say I need a, another housing cover on the other side. I see this far too often where you'll go insert components, browse for the component, find it, place it, insert it. Well, if the component's already in your assembly, you don't need to do that. Now take this round cover. You can do this from the feature tree or the graphics window. I'll do it from the graphics window. If you hold down the control key and just drag that part, it's going to create a copy of it. You can also do it from the tree. Just select the part in the tree, control drag, creates a copy of it. So if the part's already there, you don't have to go searching for it again. Just control drag and you'll create a copy. So I created one too many. I'll delete one. And now I want to smart mate this one. And again, if I hold down the right mouse button, I can orient it kind of how I want it. And then if I do an alt drag, I can once again do the peg and hole mate, tab to switch alignment, and I've already mated my second cover. So copy, or copy components from the tree or from the graphics area. Just hold down the control key, and you can drag the part. Quick way to make a copy. Tip number 25, use isolate. The isolate command is super useful for doing um, basically hiding parts that are getting in the way. So I've already made it up my entire housing here, but I forgot one internal component. And this component needs to be mated on the inside of my housing. Now, I could hide the components and make my mates and unhide the components. That's definitely a way to do it. Or I could use isolate. So the way you use isolate is I'm just going to control select the three components I want to work with. And I'm going to right click and select isolate. It is going to temporarily hide everything that I'm not dealing with, which will allow me to just add a smart mate. I'm going to alt drag to add a concentric mate here. And I'll just visually place it in the center of my housing so that when I'm done with isolate, I can hit this exit isolate command. And I've now completely mated everything on the inside without having to deal with hide and unhide of any components. So that was just a right click and isolate. You can isolate multiple components at the same time if you need to. So tip, tip number 26, select over geometry. This is a really useful one, especially if you're dealing with big assemblies and you need to choose components, really small components. Now, I think we all know if you click out in space and you move your mouse, you'll have two selection windows. Left to right is select everything to the inside. 
right to the left is select everything that's intersecting. So that's what those two colors mean. But let's say I want to go and select all the instruments on my panel, but if I try to drag, it's telling me the component is fully defined. It thinks I want to move the component. It won't allow me to create a selection window. So there is now a selection technique under the select icon where you can select over geometry. What that allows you to do is then start a selection window regardless of anything that's behind it. So then I can right click and hide. Now what's even better is select over geometry has its own hotkey. It's the T key. T is in tango. So if you hit the T key without going to the select geometry, if I hit the T key, I can then just select directly over geometry, select all of my components, and then you can right click hide or however you want to do that. So I'll select one of these components and just say, you know what, hide all of my instruments on my panel. So that is a quick way of selecting over geometry, either hit the T key or that new select over geometry from the selection menu. So it works with selection filters as well, so it's a great way of maybe selecting all the edges if you want. So hit the T key, use select over geometry, especially in those big assemblies. So tip number 27, we're going to move to drawings. Show hide annotations. This happens a lot, especially on tech support. Uh, we get a lot of calls where we've hidden some annotations. Now hiding is the easy part. Let's say I have some balloons and I want to take all of these balloons right here and I'm going to right click and I have the option to hide. So again, hiding is easy, but now how do I show those? Now this is a really common question we get, you know, my balloons were there, now they're not, they're, they've been deleted, what happened, they're gone. Well, maybe they've just been hidden. So in this case, if you ever want to unhide any annotations, this is a very specific command and I wish it was uh, more obvious, but under the view menu, under hide show, there's a command called hide show annotations. So if we launch this hide show annotations, what it's going to do is show any hidden annotations light gray. And while this command is active, notice there's an icon next to my mouse that has an eyeball. As I select these annotations, it will unhide these annotations for me. So you have to hit escape uh, to get out of that command when you're done, otherwise you're still in hide show. But hiding is easy, just right click and hide. If you ever want to show anything that's been hidden, view, hide show, annotations, and then you can select them to unhide your components. So hide show annotations. Tip number 28 you can 3D rotate your section views. So what that means is, let's go ahead and go to one of our views here. Let's create a normal section view. I'm just going to do a horizontal section top to bottom here. And I'm going to place my section view. Kind of an extra tip, if you want to break your alignment, hold down the control key. It'll allow you to place your section views or projected views wherever you want to. So I'm going to go ahead and place my section view up here. Now that's a pretty normal section view. But if you didn't know you could do this, you can right click your section views and you can actually set it to what's called an isometric section to give you an isometric view of that section view. Now to take it a step further as well, you're not locked into what just SOLIDWORKS gives you. You can also select this view and use this command up here called 3D Rotate View. And then you can place this section view in any orientation you want. And as soon as you hit the green check, you've now got your section view in that 3D orientation directly on your drawing. So with any section view, you can right click, uh, you can go to your isometric section, or if you want to go even further, use your 3D rotate view and you can really get some complex section views going to display exactly or show exactly what you want it to show. So tip number 29, move dimensions. So in this case, I've used model items on my drawing. And let's say this, this dimension may look better on a different view. Now, if that dimension can exist on another view, what you can do is if you hold down the shift key and drag it, it will allow you to drop that dimension in that other view, still be fully associated and know exactly what edges you're going to. So this is still a fully associated dimension through the model items to the part, and that's because I use the shift drag. So if you use model items and you want to reassociate, and that dimension can exist. Notice if it can't exist, it's going to give you that kind of a symbol that says you can't do that, stop. 
So if it can exist, it will allow you to drag that dimension using the Shift key. Now Shift moves, you can also use Control drag and it will copy that dimension. So now I have two of them. So I don't recommend copying on um, important dimensions because it may cause some conflicts. So if you have some extras, you can just delete those. But Shift drag will move, Copy drag will copy dimensions between views and keep the association. Now tip number 30, resize your text box. So resizing your text box helps if you're ever trying to create a note and you don't want to play the guess the font game. So a couple notes about notes. In this case, I'm going to create a new note and start typing. Now notice as I start typing that that box is just going to resize to infinity. So a couple tips when dealing with notes. If you don't want that to happen, what you can do is resize your text box first and then as you type it's going to auto return for you. Now another way to do that instead of resizing your box is as you create your note, just drag. That's going to create a resized box for you. And then as you type, things will be inside that box that will auto carriage return for you. Now the real tip in this one is let's say I want to create a title. And I'm going to call this EXP Rotor Assembly. And let's say our titles have to be a much bigger font. So instead of 12 point, we'll do something like just 16 for now. But you can see my font doesn't exactly fit inside my drawing number box. So if this ever happens to you and you're kind of dictated to which point font you have to use, if you double click the note, select everything in it, there's a little box here called fit text. And if you select fit text, it will allow you to resize your text box and it's going to change your spacing, so not your point font, and it'll change your spacing to get everything to fit. So use fit text whenever you have a box that you need to fit in there. It's going to change your spacing. That way you don't have to play the guess the font game when you're trying to get your, get your notes and everything to fit inside your title block as you want to. And then I've got one last tip for you. Uh, I know this is 31, but tip 15 wasn't really a real tip. That was just kind of an intermission. So to get your value for your 30th tip, uh, use all uppercase. So a lot of times in drawings, we're dictated to use all uppercase for things like notes or bill of materials. So you may see a note like this, and I'm going to use um, a combination of case sensitive. So unless otherwise specified, one, use stainless, two, deburr all edges. So there's my note. Notice it's a combination of uppercase and lowercase. So if you are mandated to use all uppercase and you've already created a note, you don't have to delete it and remake it. Just select your note and in your properties you have a little checkbox here for all uppercase. Now what's nice about that is it will remember what your case was. So if you uncheck it, it will go back to how you drew it or how you wrote it. So if you want to switch or you don't want to switch, use this all uppercase. It will easily just transition everything to all uppercase. Now what's really nice is this works for bill of materials as well. So in this case we have a part number. This part number is dictated by the file name, how you saved it. So a lot of times when we're saving the file, we're not thinking about all uppercase or the bill of materials. So in this case, what they've done is they've added the ability to, if you select your bill of materials, there's an icon up here for all uppercase inside the bill of materials. And again, it's going to remember the case sensitive uh, part names, so you can always go back but it's an easy way to transition from all lowercase to all uppercase inside the BOM or inside the note, uh, wherever you need to put that all uppercase. So that's what I have for you guys. Uh, I know you're all muted, so it says clap if you learned something. If you can see where the clap icon is in the participation menu, go ahead and hit that if you learned something. Uh, I hope everybody here picked up at least one tip. So, you know, whether you've been using SOLIDWORKS for 10 days or 10 years, you can always learn something else. So I hope everybody learned at least one thing. And again, email me for the, either a PDF of this presentation or let me know about a tip and trick you want to see in the presentation. So with that, um, we have some upcoming webinars, but I just want to thank everybody for coming and register for some uh, webinars in the future from us. So thanks again, everybody, and have a good one.